Previously on Detective. We went to the police department, and um, I went to the sergeant at the desk and said, my brother just killed somebody. My brother going to prison, I don't think it was nearly as tough on him as it was me. Due to the graphic nature of the content, Detective may not be suitable for all audiences. Snitches, informants, confidential informants, CIs, whatever you want to call them. Anyone that talks to the police for any reason is viewed as a snitch. There was a point when one told me that a police officer can't catch a cold without a good snitch. The belief that people want to live in neighborhoods that are under siege is probably the biggest line of bull I've ever heard in my life because they don't. That's Detective Rod Demery. Detective Demery's mother was brutally murdered when he was a young child. A moment that would send him on a lifelong search for justice. Not just for his mother's murder, but for all who have been wronged. This tragic event set his older brother Patrick on a different course that would bring him eventually to Rod's door, covered in blood, admitting to murder. After turning his brother in, Rod would throw himself into his law enforcement career, full of undercover work and confidential informants. I'm Garnsey Sloan for Investigation Discovery, and this is Season 3 of Detective, True Stories from Behind the Yellow Tape, the ones you don't hear on TV. This episode, Snitch. After I dropped my brother off at the police department, I remember walking out of the police station. And, you know, my grandfather was getting older. Um, my grandmother, she was uh, comatose, for, for lack of a better word, from a stroke. But I remember leaving my brother, and when I was walking away, I'm not an emotional person. I'm not a crier. But I, I stood in front of the police department, and I cried. And it was because I felt felt like, this is it. This is just me. I was alone. And there was no way I was going to stay in California. He wouldn't see his brother again for 15 years. I think at that point in life, I realized that maybe you wouldn't need this person or that person. Or I think that's probably when I realized I didn't need anything. It's kind of odd because growing up, I was surrounded by my, my grandparents and my extended family. And maybe I thought I needed that, but the reality was is I didn't need any of that. It was a point in life where I was trying to find out who I was and what I was capable of doing. And it was one of those positions that I was forced into to actually realize that I was on my own and I had to make my own life. So when I went back to be with my, soon to be my ex-wife, I was actually just buying time because I, could, I knew that relationship wasn't going to work. I just didn't feel like she had my back. After he and his ex-wife split up, Rod visited his father in his hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana. There were some openings at the local police department, so he decided to stay. Ironically, I uh, worked for the prison system, Louisiana Department of Corrections, for about three months, and that was because I had to go through all the background and psychological tests for the police department, so it took about three months to get hired. I started working patrol for a little while, Rod's talent was quickly recognized, and he soon found himself working in narcotics. I think I was um, fascinated, like everyone else, with narcotics, Miami Vice type stuff. So Crockett and Tubbs were your heroes? Yeah, well, you know. You wanted to be the flashy well, cop? Know, well, no, no. I, I mean, they had the Ferrari and Phil Collins, and, you know, so, so much excitement going on there. And I could see myself doing that. But seriously, there was a real drug problem in Shreveport. Ecstasy pills had been a big deal, but by and large, the biggest drug or drug problem would be cocaine, crack cocaine specifically. And when did you see a rise in crack consumption in Shreveport? Was it before you even arrived there? Yeah, it was there? before I even got there. The crack epidemic happened about late 80s, early 90s, and crack cocaine just kind of took off. And I don't think it's even subsided at all since then. Hasn't been overtaken by meth? Uh, no, I think different drugs for different types of people and different demographics. And they're kind of interchangeable. When one can't find one, they'll go to the other. So availability is a, a big deal. Were you working undercover? Yeah, I had experience working undercover. So put together units and we bought drugs and arrested people after we did. Rod had his sights set on homicide. 
but he knew he had to prove himself there first. Narcotics is always looking for someone that can fit an undercover role or infiltrate something that everybody else may be burned on already or people know who they are. Even if you can fit in, you have to be able to present your evidence or your reports in a professional manner. I think the, the, the other part is that you actually have to understand police work and basic police principles and safety and display a certain level of competency as a police officer. You know, your presentation and your ability to mix within the police department and the community as well. So who comes to you and says, do you want to work narcotics advice? One of the narco guys, one of the bearded guys. I was initially contacted by one of the actual investigators or narco agents. I worked an operation with them where we did some undercover buys, some reverse stings. I worked a vice operation, and that was uh, different. What's the difference between narco and vice? Well, vice was a prostitution sting. And narcotics was narcotics. So the same group of individuals, uh, you know, SWAT guys, special investigators, worked both. So the narcotics part was pretty easy. I was assigned to work a vice operation where there was a big call girl ring thing going on. What happens is, is that you're this undercover person. You're in a hotel room. And they basically start calling up call girls to come solicit. I was in a hotel room, and they're in a adjoining room. And, you know, they're listening to all this on a microphone. And we had code words to, you know, she's made the deal. So they come in and they make their arrest. The code word or phrase was pretty titties. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the girl comes in and, uh, you know, she's doing her thing. She's telling me how much it's going to cost and it's done. So I yell out the code word. There's no response. And this girl starts to disrobe, and uh, I yell it out again. And um, <laughs> she's like, "What's wrong about, with you?" <laughs> it's like, "Damn, you really got some pretty titties, right?" <laughs> so, about the third or fourth time, they come in and they're laughing because they heard me the first time. I just think they just wanted me to sweat. So, I knew at that point that I was uh, actually being baptized in. So, I arrest this girl, and she's charged with solicitation or prostitution, whatever it was at that time. I think maybe a year later, I went to the power company. I was paying my electricity bill, and there was this girl that was in front of me. I recognized her, but she didn't recognize me. It was her? It was her. She turns around, and she says, hey, I know you from somewhere. I said, ah, I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe we went to high school together. And she's laughing, and she's like, yeah, you arrested me. And I was like, yeah, you still uh, prostituting? Of course she was, but she told me about a shooting that had happened, just knowing that I was a police officer. And, you know, there was a shooting that happened on whatever street. And um, this guy, he's the one who did it. He's the person you're looking for. And from that point, I started getting information from her. I don't know what her motivation was. Probably didn't want to get in any trouble or want to have some ally with the police because most people do. And that actually went from shootings to robberies to homicides. And I mean, she was just great. She was a great informant. And then I think she maybe, knew all of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, From she's, pillow talk or just her ear yeah, to the ground? You know, and the other thing is most of our prostitutes use cab drivers. And um, cab drivers would always pass on information. So just being in that life and being in that environment, she heard a lot of things. Some of it was pretty accurate and some of it wasn't. But I got a lot of great information from her. At some point, she changed her life and decided she wanted to go to pharmacy school. She was really smart, really bright. She actually went to pharmacy school, and I was happy for her, but I was a little disappointed because that information was always valuable. Over the years, you learn a lot about your informants, and in this particular case, I learned a lot about her. I found out she had started prostituting when she was like 14 years old. She ended up dropping out of high school, but ultimately went back, you know, got a GD. The problem is, is you can't get really close to informants because your job is to get information from them and them not from you. So you have to be very careful with those types of situations because the last thing you need is for someone to say there's some sort of inappropriate relationship between you and that person. So you you have to remain guarded and remember that you're a police officer. It's not unlike undercover work. There's sort of a Stockholm Syndrome that develops, and you have this relationship that's not really a relationship, but the loyalties are just as real as if it were. So how does a police officer navigate those relationships without getting into trouble? That's next.
Detective Rod Demery knows how to work an informant, and he has the track record to prove it. If you um, solve a crime and it's successfully prosecuted and you haven't exposed anybody, any of your informants or any of your witnesses that are not wanting to be exposed and people kind of, well, I can tell this guy that or they can tell their friend, well, you know, I talked to this guy or they'll pass on information and it just kind of has a cause and effect where it works out for the investigator. I think the biggest thing that any police officer or detective has to learn his communication skills. And not so much as that they have to be well-versed or be able to articulate certain things, but they have to be able to relate to people and have people relate to them. That's what policing is all about, really. The reality is, is that it's a partnership. That's how I work the streets. You have to allow people to fill you out, I guess. And you have to be able to um, realize that you're not really any different from anybody else. Your opinions and your personality and your beliefs really don't matter. You're now an agent for all those other people. So you kind of forfeit your right to have any opinions. And I think when people realize that serious about what you do, then it makes your job a whole lot easier. How long did it take you once you were back in Shreveport to sort of establish those connections with the community? On Shreveport, it was kind of easy, actually. Shreveport had a checkered past, and some of the places in Shreveport, or some of the attitudes in Shreveport were, like most inner cities, where people feel a disconnect or, or distrust. So it wasn't difficult. I go to a barber shop, or I go where people hung out, and it was just kind of a familiarity, you know, conversation. The belief that people want to live in neighborhoods that are under siege is probably the biggest line of bull I've ever heard in my life, because they don't. When the community fears criminals more than they trust you, you got a problem. I think they have a certain element of police officers they trust, and I don't think it's what class or race or anything you come from. It's not that. It's just a matter of this person's going to do right by me, I'm going to do right by them, and it's a very mutual respect. Most police officers, uh, we by nature have egos and an arrogance about us. But if you're totally honest with yourself, you realize it's actually a humbling experience and it's an overwhelming charge to have somebody have that kind of trust in you. And I think when people realize that you recognize that, they're more apt to help you out. You are Crockett or Tub. You have those snitches that you've had forever. And I have always had those types of relationships with my informants. Tell me about what a snitch is and how the street views a snitch. Snitches, informants, confidential informants, CIs, whatever you want to call them. Anyone that talks to the police for any reason is viewed as a snitch. There was a point when one told me that a police officer can't catch a cold without a good snitch. The concept of having a no snitching thought process is just perpetuated and created by criminals. When you really think about it, no one wants to see someone shooting up their neighborhood or selling drugs or breaking in houses. And there are people that are professional informants that do it for money. They do it for, you know, maybe they got pending charges. I've had informants that had children that had charges or guys that their girlfriend had been arrested for shoplifting or something. They wanted some sort of consideration for their cooperation. I think it all depends on their motivation. Why are they doing this? And if you dig deep enough from your informant, you can usually tell why. More often than not, in my experience, has always been someone that had some sort of trouble with the law. Secondly, it was always somebody that was motivated by the little fees that they got paid. Thirdly, it was somebody that was afraid of whatever neighborhood they were living in and they wanted some sort of assurance or protection. So there's a, a wide variety of reasons why, and I think the actual motivation of the person who's informing is what's important. If you have someone that's a legitimate criminal and no better than the person they're telling on, it's kind of productive. You then become, law enforcement becomes a pawn of that person. It's just not a good situation. Usually it's someone that has a personal stake for whatever reason. Give me a case where an informant has been critical in the solve. There was a murder that happened in 2009. Actually, two murders in 2009. Fast forward to 2012, there's another murder. 
happened to be sitting in my office where the detectives that were working this 2012 murder brought in a guy who was an actual snitch. They didn't know who committed this crime, but they had a suspicion of who committed the crime, and the snitch was explaining to the detectives that this guy was buying drugs and he was going out of town to get a big shipment of drugs. And I'm just sitting here listening to this, and I'm realizing that the snitch is probably involved in this murder. And I actually walked in on him and asked him, you know, why are you snitching on your boy? You know, clearly you're, you're high up in that chain of command because you wouldn't have the information that you're providing law enforcement had you not been directly involved. So this guy's just a complete snitch. His loyalty is to no one but himself. And he gets paid. And um, eventually I find out that he was actually the person who committed the murder. Are there other significant cases that the informant came in and really guided the direction or got you started? There have been a lot of cases that start with an informant giving you some sort of direction, maybe a breadcrumb, and it can be something as insignificant as a name. One informant can give you a piece of information, another one can give you another. You can go to an informant, they may say, this guy's street name is whatever, but I don't know his name. Then you can find another informant, oh yeah, I know who that is. And then another one says, yeah, he hangs out with whomever. And you start comparing all that information and you realize that this person is probably the person you're looking for. Through all your separate informants, you're able to corroborate that information and put it together. So you got a pretty good strong indicator on who that person is. You can actually present bits and pieces of that information to your suspect and they'll realize that you know what you're talking about. It's obvious how informants would work with narcotics, but how does it work with homicide or burglary or some of the other divisions? They're probably more important than they are in narcotics. If you have a burglary or homicide, there's nothing greater than somebody calling you up and telling you who did it. And for Rod, the most important part about using a snitch is to make sure no one ever finds out they talked. You can't have your snitch being called to testify. What I always did was I used informants for leads, pointing me in the direction I needed to be. You know, this person did it, and I know they were hanging out here, and this is what happened. And you can kind of compare your notes and your theory to what this person's saying and how accurate it is. And you can build your case off the direction they lead you into. I don't know that you can actually use their information to gather warrants or or anything like that, because if you did, then you'd almost have to expose them. My opinion was always to use an informant to lead me in the right direction. If you can hone in those skills, there's not a homicide you can't solve. Next time on Detective. There was one point where he said, I propped him up because I didn't want him to choke on his blood. And I realized this guy didn't do it. As a young detective, a young homicide detective, you really kind of don't want to ruffle any feathers. So you try to be diplomatic. But I didn't agree that it was a suicide. I was dating a... woman that worked in police recruiting. How convenient. Uh, Yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm going to tell you anyways. Detective is part of the Panoply Network and was made for America's leading mystery and suspense network, Investigation Discovery, by DeFacto Sound, a sound design team dedicated to making television, film, and games sound insanely cool. It was produced by Mylon Fitzwater Barrows, with help from Stephanie Wilkes. Production oversight by producers Emily Kaiser and Elizabeth Stevenson, and executive producers Amy Angelowitz, Garnsey Sloan, and Lorna Thomas. It was recorded by Chip Sovek. Additional recording and mix by Kenneth Gilbert. Original music was composed by Chris Kennedy. Cover art was designed by Anand Glott. Special thanks to Detective Rod Demery for sharing his story with us, as well as Sean Barrows, Anastasia Brown, Judy Fitzwater, Hilary Heskett Shapiro, Heather Holloman, Sam Sneebly, Ash Sevilla, and Dallas Taylor. Subscribe on iTunes to get new episodes of Detective on your feed. And if you like the podcast, rate and review it. Check out Detective Rod Demery's new television show, Murder Chose Me, only on Investigation Discovery. I'm your host, Garnsey Sloan. Thanks for listening. <laughs>